good morning welcome to a new lecture and in this lecture we will start uh, looking into the performance of various signaling schemes. So, till now we have covered the entire theory of detection, we have seen how to detect numbers, how to detect vectors, complex vectors, real vectors, waveform and sequence of symbols. Now it is the time that we look into the performance of various signaling schemes and we start by looking into the performance only of ML signaling systems because in ML the priors are equal and when the priors are equal we begin to have the neat expressions for probability of errors because this annoying term L in eta disappears from probability of error formulas. Okay? And we have also established the equivalence between continuous time and discrete time signals. right? So, whether you look into a continuous time signal y of t or you look the vector corresponding to that continuous time signal uh, that is y uh, which belongs to a discrete time signal or you want to look into uh, the noise as n t or you want to think about the noise as vector n, it does not matter. So, we will use the same symbols for denoting the continuous time signals and discrete time signals. So, our notations are a bit sloppy here, but this is because there is complete equivalence between the two words. right? So, we use the notation y to denote the received signal, it also denotes continuous time signal or discrete time signal. SI we denotes, we use for denoting transmitted signal. So, both it can mean a continuous time signal or a discrete time signal. So, Y is the received signal and N is the noise at the channel. Okay? So, Right? So, get used to this fact. Right? Now, we will start in this lecture, we will concentrate on performance of binary signaling systems and we have already looked into this. So, for example, we have looked into the uh, probability of errors in case of 2 PAM right? or binary PAM and whenever we are saying probability of errors, we means probability of symbol error with what errors the symbols are decoded uh, incorrectly. Okay. We will talk about probabilities of bit errors later on. For binary signaling, there is no difference between bit errors or symbol errors because every symbol corresponds to a bit. So, bit errors are same as symbol errors in case of binary signaling, but in case of M error signaling, this is not the case. Right? So, at this moment, we are just concentrating on symbol errors and later we will see how can you relate the symbol errors to bit errors. All right. So, probability of errors or probability of symbol errors in two PAM systems we have already obtained was Q of uh, under root of 2 E B by N naught. In case of unipolar signaling, the probability of error was Q of under root of E B by N naught. These formulas must be learned by heart. In general, we can say that the probability of error is Q of D by 2 sigma, where D we said denotes the distance between the received signals and sigma was the standard deviation of the noise. Let us now try to understand this d and sigma in more depth and this is really useful and we will understand this through couple of examples. So, get used to the notations here. So, y 1 t is the received signal at the input of a matched filter or at the input of a filter with an impulse response of h t followed by a sampler. So, this is the receiver that we are using and we have seen that this is the most optimal receiver. So, y i t is s t plus n t if bit 1 is transmitted and if bit 0 is transmitted then we just have noise waveform. Okay? So, we just have noise waveform when 0 bit is transmitted and when, when 1 bit is transmitted, we have signal plus noise. That means, it is an example of unipolar signaling. There is no signal when you are transmitting 0 bit, there is a signal when you transmit bit 1. And what we are assuming is that the signal looks like this 
and the impulse response of this filter looks like this. And we want to investigate what is d and sigma in this case, okay, so that is the question. So we are trying to understand clearly what is this d and sigma and we are not trying to learn it by heart, okay. What is d? So what is this vt first, let us let us clear the notation, vt is the output of this filter, so this is v of t and we say this as v1 s of t that means this is the output when one bit is transmitted and this has only the signal component, we are not considering noise because this is the distance between the two output signals, you do not have to consider noise in this. So this simply denotes what is the signal content at the output of a filter given that the bit 1 is transmitted minus the signal content at the output of a filter given 0 bit is transmitted. So this is distance and this distance we have to evaluate for t equals to 0 because this sampler is at t equals to 0. So at the output of the sampler we would have this as d and this d corresponds to the distance between the signals, the case 1 bit is transmitted and 0 bit is transmitted, alright. So what is this V1 S of t? So what is the signal content when 1 bit is transmitted? Signal content is S t, is not it? Isn't it when bit 1 is transmitted? So we need to have the input as S of tau. At the output of a filter, we would have the output given by the convolution of input with an impulse response of the filter. So you know from the course in signals and systems, the output of a filter is simply the convolution of input with impulse response, so we are carrying out that. So this is bit sloppy, so this is V0 S, okay. So this is the signal content when bit 0 is transmitted, all right. And when bit 0 is transmitted, there is no signal content, hence V 0 S of t is 0. V 1 S at 0, so we want to find out this thing at t equals to 0, so you have to put t equals to 0. If you want to put t equals to 0 in here, you simply get v1 s of 0 as this thing. So you look at the output, output is the convolution of input with impulse response and you look at that output at t equals to 0, okay, so you get this. Let us see how we can work this out. So we know s of tau that is given to us, h of minus tau is simply the flipped version of the impulse response, so this is this. We need to multiply this with this and we get this signal. You integrate this thing from minus infinity to plus infinity, you get 1. So we have got the output corresponding to the bit 1 when you are sampling the output at t equals to 0, all right. Now what is the distance? Distance is this minus this and this we have seen is 1 and this we have seen is 0, so distance is 1, easy. How to find out the sigma? Variance of the noise at the output of a filter is given by the variance of the noise at the input and because input is a white Gaussian noise, we know that its variance is n0 by 2 and then the variance at the output of a filter is simply this thing, this we have looked into lecture 17. So to find out the power spectral density of noise at the output of a filter, you have to multiply the input power spectral density with this quantity. And from Parseval's theorem, these two things are same, whether you want to find out h square t dt 
from minus infinity to plus infinity or you want to integrate uh, mod square h f from minus infinity to plus infinity from Parseval's theorem both these integrations will lead to the same result. Integrating this thing is easier because this has been given to us and what is this? So, this is 1 between 0 and minus 1. So, this integration is simply 1, the area is 1 and hence the output power spectral density or output variance is same as n0 by 2. So, sigma is square root of n0 by 2 because it is a standard deviation. So, from this we can find the probability of error which is q of d by 2 sigma, d we have found as 1, sigma we have found as square root of n0 by 2 and this can be reworked to this easy. But mostly we want to write the probability of error in terms of the square root of E b by n0. We have seen in the formulas before that probability of error is q function of a square root of E b by n0 and there might be some constants here and there. But what we know for sure that probability of error should be containing this terms q function and it is mostly q of under root of E b by n0 and there might be some missing constant. That missing constant we say as eta cap and we want to investigate that eta cap. Eta cap if you see will be simply d by 2 sigma because we have seen that the argument inside q function is d by 2 sigma. So, eta cap is simply d by 2 sigma divided by root of E b by n0. d we have found as 1 sigma we found as square root of n0 by 2, what is E b? What is bit energy? So, in this case the bit energy is half integration of s square t dt. So, this is because let us remind this. So, you have bit energy 0 when 0 is transmitted, you have bit energy integration of s square t dt when 1 is transmitted. So, on an average if they are equiprobable and they are equiprobable because we are in the ML regime, this will be half this thing all right and this we have evaluated to be 2. So, this is half times 2 which is 1. All right, so we have got E b as also 1, so eta cap is 1 by root 2. All right, now if you want to write this probability of error in terms of eta cap, this would be q of 1 by root 2 times root of abno, and you can write this as this neat. So, for this system which was not fed with a mesh filter, but it, it was just some filter. We can also evaluate probability of error and why we are doing this is because we want you to become an expert in evaluating probability of error for whatever kind of a filter is present and this will make things more generic and interesting. Now, let us take an impulse response. So, every setting setting remains same. So, we are doing uh, this question for the same setting. We will be just changing few things here and there. Other than that, everything remains same as was in this question. So, we are having y of y i of t feeding to a uh, filter and a sampler and when there is a bit 1, we are sending this. When there is a bit 0, we are sending this. S t remains this. Whatever we will change we will point out that to you. So, here we are changing as the impulse response of the filter. So, actually we are using matched filter. How do you know that this is matched filter? So, we know that the signal is like this and matched filter impulse response should be s of minus t. So, you just have to flip this around and when you flip this around you will get an impulse response like this. 
So now we have changed the filter to a matched filter and we want to investigate the same things. So V1 S of 0 is same as before, but now H of minus tau is simply S of tau because it is a matched filter. So this is simply integration of S square tau from minus infinity to plus infinity and this we have seen is simply 2 times E b. Distance in this case is thus 2 times E b. What is sigma square? Sigma square if you evaluate everything remains same, h t is s t. So, h of t is s of minus t. So, h square t is simply s square minus t and you know that if you want to integrate this or you integrate this you should get the same answer because we are integrating from minus infinity to plus infinity. So, if you take a signal or you take the time reversed version of the signal, if you integrate both signals you get the same answer and we know that what is this quantity this is 2 times E b. So, sigma square is n naught times E b. What is the probability of error? Is q of d by 2 sigma d we have calculated as 2 times E b, sigma we have calculated as square root of n naught E b. So, there the answer that we get is probability of error if we use a mash filter is q of root of E b by n naught. All right. So, this is the answer that we have also got for unipolar signaling mechanism and this in fact is a unipolar signaling mechanism. And when we have gone from waveform to vectors, we said that the way that we want to do is you have to use correlators or mesh filters and if you get the mesh filters that is an optimal way to convert waveforms to vectors. Okay. So, the probability of error formula that we derived was actually assuming that I have a mesh filter and a sampler and we see that if you run this out from basics you get the same answer. Can we think about this in some other ways as uh, looking into again why is this mesh filter the most optimum filter? Because what you want to do is you want to maximize this quantity d by 2 sigma and what is d? In case of unipolar signaling is this thing, is not it? And what sigma? Sigma is, so if you see this, sigma square is n naught by 2 times h square t dt. We have written this formula several times. So, sigma is square root of n naught by 2 square root of this thing. All right. So, substituting sigma in here and the question that we ask is for what h t is this quantity maximum? This is not a function of h t, this is rather some constant. We do not worry about constants. We want to find out the impulse response for which this quantity is maximum and if you have not done this vector analysis, trying to find out h t might worry you, but because we have done this vector analysis, things are pretty trivial. What is this? This is the inner product of signal s t with h of minus t, inner product is same as dot product. So, this is simply norm of s times norm of h of minus t cos of angle between s t and h of minus t. If you want you can have t in here does not matter because s t is same as s in our notations. Divided by what is this? This is simply the square root of energy and the square root of energy 
is simply the norm of the vector, all right. I am treating signals as vectors and I can cancel this with this and I get this thing is simply norm of s times cos of angle of s and h of minus t. And when is this quantity maximum? When this angle is 0, then cos of 0 is maximum 1. And when is this angle 0? When h of minus t is some constant times s of t. That means, these two vectors are collinear. h of minus t is simply s of t times some constant. Okay. C is a constant. So, if this is there, then h of t is simply some constant times h s of minus t and this simply proves that matched filter is an optimum receiver. It is an optimum filter to use. All right. And what is that maximum value? So, if you put h of minus t as c times, if you substitute this in here, you get c and in, uh, you get norm of s and instead of this you get c times norm of st and this is also c times norm of st, this cancels with this, c cancels with this, you simply get norm of s. Do not worry about whether I should use norm of s or norm of st, these are one and the same thing. So, the maximum value of the expression, this expression is simply norm of s and we killed out this root of 2 n naught. So, I have it back here and norm of s is simply, so norm square of s is 2 e b, this we have seen. So, norm of s is the square root of 2 e b and we get d by 2 sigma is the square root of e b by n naught. We are going, we are getting the same answer again and again. I am just trying to say to you that whatever methods you choose as generic as trying to find out what is the distance between the two received signals and the output of a sampler and you start to evaluate d by 2 sigma from that or you choose any other method does not matter, you get the same answer. What also we have proven in this course is we have proven that matched filter is actually an optimum receiver and this is quite clear, right, if you look at this ratio of d by 2 sigma. Let us have more fun and now let us use the impulse response again which is not same as matched filter, it is an impulse response that we have used in the first example. But now what I do is I have a sampler at t equals to 0, I collect a number d 1, I use a sampler at t equals to 1, I collect a number d 2 and I form my decision statistics by subtracting this d 2 from d 1 and I define this as number d and see what happens in this case. All right. So, if, if you look at d 1, d 1 would be obtained by multiplying s of tau with h of minus tau, you get this thing and you integrate this and you get d 1 as 1. I am doing it too fast because we have already covered two examples, right. You work this out first and then look at the answer. This is kind of uh, answer to the question that I have asked. When thinking about d 2, I have to take s of tau. So, this is s of tau. And this is h of 1 minus tau because I am looking down the output at t equals to 1. So, remember in convolution we had s of tau h of t minus tau d tau. So, if t is 1, then I have to multiply s of tau with h of 1 minus tau which is the signal. When I multiply these two things up, I get this. If I integrate this, I get minus 1. 
and thus the decision statistic which is formed by D1 minus D2 is simply 2 for sigma square. Sigma square is this thing we have been using this couple of times times 2 because whenever I am sampling I am getting noise in one degree of freedom, noise power in one real degree of freedom to be precise and that noise power in one real degree of freedom is n0 by 2. I am sampling twice, so I will have noise power in two real degrees of freedom and because the noise is independent, its power will simply add and I have a factor 2 in here which by substituting in the value of h square t that we have sigma square is simply n0. And the question is also an interesting question. So, whenever I am sampling the output at t equals to 0 or at t equals to 1, does the input noise power spectral density remain same or does it change? It remains same because we assume white Gaussian noise and one of the properties of white Gaussian noise is also a stationary random process. If it is a stationary random process, at whatever time you want to look at it, you are going to have the same noise power available per degree of freedom. And thus n0 by 2 is invariant of the sample time. So, noise power does not change with the sampling time instances the signal power do change right because at certain times the signal power may peak or it may be zero the sampling instances determine what signal power you have at the output but it does not influence the noise power all right so d by 2 sigma d we have said is 2 and sigma is square root of n0 so we get 1 by root of n0 and this is same as root of E b by n0. Thus, what we have seen is in this case we are getting the same d by 2 sigma as we got in the case of a matched filter. This is interesting. The filter that we have used is not a matched filter, it is not the optimum filter to start with, but the answer that we are getting, the performance that we are get, getting is similar to the performance that we got when we used a matched filter. And why is this so? The reason is that we are sampling it at two time instances instead of one time instance. So, when we look at this picture, when we sample it at t equals to 0, the filter behaved like this, and when I sample this at t equals to 1, and I have taken the negative of this statistic the actually filter behave like this. Okay. So, at t equals to 0 filter behave like this, at t equals to 1 and with a negative sign in there the filter behave like this. And thus I am constructing a matched filter from a simple filter by sampling the output process at multiple time instances, in this case two time instances. Okay. So, the idea is that you can construct something like matched filter by having more samples. You can also understand this from a different perspective. So, when you pass a process through a filter, you get more information about the signals if you have uh, chosen the sample points appropriately to be precise. And in this case, by just having two sample points, I have uh, got a performance which is same like that of a mesh filter. Can I get a better performance by sampling it even more than 2 times? Let us say if I have sampled it 10 times, the answer is no. Think the reason why is that. Okay. To have more fun in this performance analysis, let us introduce a new parameter which we call as power efficiency. This power efficiency will help us in two things. First, it will help us in arriving at this bit error rate or symbol error rate per formulas 
rather quickly and then it will give us some quick insight into the performance of various signaling schemes. All right, let us get started and then see whether it serves the two purposes which I have just pointed out. So, power efficiency we define as d square by E b, d is the distance between the two signals or symbols and E b is the bit energy. Let us start understanding this from a simple antipodal binary PAM system, binary antipodal PAM system and D in this case is 2 A, right. So, D square is 4 A square, what is the bit energy? So, bit energy is this energy A square plus this energy A square divided by 2, so A square. So, we have got D square, we have got E B and we have got power efficiency which is D square by E V which is 4. Interesting thing is it does not depend upon A, where you what A you have chosen for this constellation. That means, whether you calculate the power efficiency of this constellation or power efficiency of this constellation, you get the same power efficiency. Hence, we call that power efficiency is a scale invariant parameter. What does it mean? If you take in this constellation, if you zoom this up, on zooming you are changing the scale, but zooming a constellation will not influence its power efficiency and hence power efficiency is a scale invariant parameter and that is why we love this. More so ever, any constellation scheme can have a better error performance if you have a lot of distance between the symbols, but then they have to pay the penalty in terms of bit energy. So, having this factor d square by E b tries to really quantify how power efficient a constellation scheme is. Okay. So, these are two important things that E v uh, that eta p serves. First thing is that this is an scale invariant parameter. So, it really characterizes a constellation structure and secondly, it gives us a good idea about how power efficient a modulation scheme is because it is a ratio of the distance squared between the symbols and it also depends upon how much energy you have to spend per bit. So, we have already looked into this probability of error and we have said that this is Q of d by 2 sigma and what is d? So, we know that d square by E b is eta. So, d is actually square root of eta p E b, this is eta p. So, d is the square root of eta p E b and sigma is the square root of n naught by 2. Okay. So, let us first revise what we have learned in the mesh filter. So, we know that in case of mesh filter, this d is simply norm square of s and why is this? Because we have seen that d is s of tau h of t minus tau d tau integration from minus infinity to plus infinity and when we want to sample this at t equals to 0, this simply is s of tau h of minus tau's integration from minus infinity to plus infinity and when it is a mesh filter, this h of minus tau is simply s of tau and so this corresponds to energy of s, right. So, when we are having a mesh filter, we know that d is simply energy of s. What is the standard deviation of noise at the output of the sampler? It is simply square root of n naught by 2 multiplied by norm of s, right. And why is this? Because we know that variance is n naught by 2 times 
norm of s is square. So, the standard deviation is the square root of n naught by 2 uh, multiplied by norm of s. So, what is this d by 2 sigma? d by 2 sigma is simply norm of s divided by 2 times a square root of n naught by 2. So, I can also interpret d as the distance of the input signal and I can also interpret the sigma as the standard deviation of noise at the input to this matched filter. So, when I am having a matched filter and this is normally the case, I can assume sigma to be the standard deviation of noise at the input of a filter and I can interpret d as the distance between the input signals. Okay. So, what we have got is that this could be rearranged to this thing that means probability of error is q of root of eta p so this is deciding factor times e b by 2 and not. So, if for a modulation scheme or for a constellation system you know eta p you can easily obtain the probability of error. This is also one formula that you must know right or you must learn one of the formula and should have the ability to go back and forth between various formulas. I personally try to remember this one. Okay. So, the probability of error is q of a square root of eta p times abno by 2. Okay. Let us see if we can use this formula and can derive the probability of error for various constellation schemes. Let us start with on off keying which is also unipolar that means you transmit let us say 1 this symbol and for 0 you transmit this symbol. It does not mat matter whether you assign this a bit 1 or this a bit 1 right except for implementation issues uh, where you want to match the Zoring operation to multiplication operation and this we have seen before. Okay. But that is basically implementation point of view otherwise theoretically there is no difference. So, power efficiency is d square by E b, d in this case is d E b is, so for this you are spending d square, for this you are spending 0, so E b is d square by 2. So, power efficiency is 2. Okay. For antipodal, let us assume that the distance between these two symbols is 2 d. So, this is at d, this is at minus d. So, eta p is 2 d square divided by bit energy which is d square and thus power efficiency in this case is 4. For equal energy frequency shift keying, binary frequency shift keying, equal energy means that both these symbols have the same energy. If I assume that this symbol is at d distance from origin, this symbol is at d distance from origin. In frequency shift keying, we are using two, two ortho normal basis functions. right? So, the distance between these two symbols is root of 2 d, power efficiency is root of 2 d square divided by d square, bit energy is simply d square. For this, you need d square energy for this we need d square energy. So, power efficiency is 2. We can look at the different modulation schemes OK power efficiency is 2 antipodal for which we can consider binary phase shift keying. So, binary phase shift keying is also uh, same as antipodal PAM. The power efficiency we got is 4 for FSK, PPM or the orthogonal systems or orthogonal modulation using walsh hadamard codes, they have the same constellation because they work on the same underlying principle. Only implementation methods of these modulation schemes are different. Performance wise, they are same at least in uh, AWGN channel. Okay. So, the power efficiency for this modulation schemes is 2. And how do we get probability of error? It is simple, you just 
have to substitute in that formula the power efficiency. All right. Why this is known as power efficiency? That is also important. Why is this term power efficiency used for this ratio? Let us try to understand this. Let us see what is this P of E. P of E we know it is a Q function of square root of eta P times F no by 2. And we have seen when x is pretty large, Q of x can be approximated as e to the power minus x square by 2. In that case, P e is simply this. Remember, this is for large x, that means it is for large f nodes. And let us now assume that two modulation schemes have the same P e. If the two modulation schemes have the same P e, then for both modulation schemes, this should be same. And if this is same, we can conveniently understand that this product for modulation scheme should be same, namely power efficiency multiplied by ABNO in one modulation scheme should be same as power efficiency multiplied by ABNO in another modulation scheme. I can also write this in log scale. So, we can also say that ABNO requirement in first modulation scheme in dB scale minus ABNO requirement in second modulation scheme in dB scale should be this ratio of power efficiency in dB scale. All right. So, for example, if the underlying schemes are FSK and BPSK, we can find out that the difference in the ABNO requirement in FSK and BPSK can be simply obtained by the ratios of the power efficiency in the two cases. So, BPSK has a power efficiency of 4, FSK has the power efficiency of 2. We divide these two power efficiencies, we get 10 log 2, 10 log 2 is 3 dB. That means the ABNO requirement in FSK systems is 3 dB more than the ABNO requirement in BPSK systems for the same error performance. And we are making this equivalence, remember, at large ABNOs. Okay. So, if I plot the probability of error versus ABNO for BPSK, which is antipodal PAM, and for OOK and FSK, which has the same power efficiency. So, they will have same probability of error versus EPNO. You should notice few things. First, probability of error with EPNO falls like a waterfall. If the probability of error and EPNOs are using log scales. So, here also we are using a log scale and EPNO we are using a dB scale, which is also a log scale. So, if we plot probability of error versus ABNO in dB scale or in log scale, you get probability of error versus ABNO, which looks like a waterfall. And if you look at this distance, you e can easily see that this distance corresponds to 3 dB. So, this distance would correspond to 10 log of the ratios of power efficiencies of BPSK and FSK. So, if you know the power efficiencies of modulation schemes, you can quickly estimate what this distance would be. All right, And hence this power efficiency is a useful metric. So, with this we have come to the conclusion of this lecture. In this lecture, we have looked into the performance of binary signaling schemes considering ML detection rules. So, whenever we are talking about ML, remember that we are assuming that priors are equal. And we have looked into the uh, BR performance for various modulation schemes. We have seen that these probability of errors can be easily derived in terms of power efficiency. Power efficiency is a scale invariant parameter 
and it simply depends upon d square pi e p. Once you can calculate this power efficiency, you can easily derive from this the probability of errors for various modulation schemes. In the next lecture, we will continue with M error detection where things are little bit more interesting and little bit more harder. Thank you.